Hello, and welcome to the Adventures Club of Los Angeles. I'm your host, Raymundo Perez, and tonight we will be discussing JPL's NYSTAR nice mission with Scott Novak, who is a mechanical engineer who is part of that mission. Welcome to the Adventurous Club. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be speaking here. Well, it's really exciting. It seems like space has always been the talk in the last couple of years. Yes. And now it's, everyone has access to all the satellite imagery that's being produced, and you're involved with that, so please. Jump in and tell me what, you, what uh, you love to talk about. So, I mean, first off, space and especially this topic is very important because uh, ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization, just landed on the moon yesterday, which is an incredible achievement. Um, and so uh, we're, we've been working with uh, the Indian Space Research Organization on this uh, project. So I'm going to be talking about some of our experiences uh, with the first major collaboration between NASA and ISRO. Well, that's really exciting. I'm looking forward to hearing more of that. Um, so to kick us off, you brought us a video for us to look at? Yeah, so well, let's see. I've got, um, do we have the images up first, or? Good luck seeing them. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Well, the uh, monitor, um, first off, um, I've got a picture and uh, want to say that when we start anything, or one of the things I've learned from our Israel colleagues, from our Indian partners, is that when you start anything, you have to give your uh, respect to Ganesha first. So this is one of the pictures I was taking when I was uh, in India at a temple dedicated to Ganesha, and so wanted to start that off. We also have a, uh, now we've got a little Ganesha idol in our uh, airlock, so as things pass through to start, uh, they get to uh, we do our due respects. Um, so that's our first uh, opening picture. Then we do have a video. Oh, that's great. Okay, and so this is uh, animation of the launch and deployment of the NISAR satellite. So we're launching out of the east coast of India near Chennai out of Srihari Kota, which is the Indian uh, equivalent to the Kennedy Space Center. on a uh, geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle, one of the uh, Indian Space Agency's heavy hitters. And here you can see the uh, satellite stage is dropping away, so that's the first stage dropping away. And then the uh, nose cone will open up, second stage will drop away, and we're on our... This is an animation. <laughs> So uh, we're a deployable spacecraft, so uh, one of the th big things that we have is a nine meter boom that's an articulated arm that's going to open up uh, so that we launch stowed in this um, tight nose cone and then we open up a nine meter boom um, in four stages and then we're going to follow that with a bloom of a reflector. So we're a synthetic aperture radar and that's gonna need a large reflector in order to uh, reflect back the signal and transmit and receive to Earth. So you can see this deployable antenna, that's a 12 meter antenna and so uh, it would be well, 40 feet, so stretching all the way across the room if we were here and that's on top of a nine meter long toothpick. And so all of this is something that can be stowed to fit into the nose cone of a uh, launch vehicle. What's it made out of? Uh, mostly carbon fiber, the uh, mesh is a proprietary uh, substance from, yeah, from Astro Northrop Grumman. And so you can see here, this is a couple of overviews of what the satellite looks like. I talked about the uh, base satellite, so there's the, uh, the box structure is a satellite bus that's giving us our uh, power and propulsion along with our solar arrays. And then on top of that, there's the heart of the instrument, that nine meter long boom, and then the 12 meter long, 12 meter diameter reflector. And so you can picture all of those things. This is a huge uh, vehicle that's going to be uh, fully deployed. And the plan for it to be deployed is next year? Yes, it's going to be launching in 2024. And it uh, deploys, uh, you can see there's a couple of days, basically one day for each deployment for the uh, four stages of the arm and then the bloom of the reflector. That's really, that's really amazing. And what is the purpose of the satellite? So it's, um, 
NICER stands for NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar. So the, there's two bands of a radar, and this is an Earth orbiting satellite that's going to be uh, effectively a Earth monitoring satellite. It is going to be making a topographical map of the planet every 12 days. Basically, all of the solid surfaces on the planet, by uh, taking two bands of radar, you're going to be able to see uh, the change in the shape of the Earth. And so basically they say it's changing Earth science. It's a great pun because it's the changing Earth, science of the changing Earth, as well as uh, making changes to the way that Earth science is done. You're going to be able to see a new 3D map of Earth every 12 days. And from that, you can see how the Earth changes shape. And so you can look at earthquakes, uh, before and after earthquakes. You can look at before and after volcanic eruptions, ice sheet collapse, uh, or crop growth or deforestation. And so it's so uh, widely powerful and what the satellite does is just produce the data and see all of these maps of how the planet changes shape. Um, and then from there, uh, the scientists on Earth can figure out what to do with that data and look at all those uh, aspects for geology or crop growth uh, or ice sheet collapse. It's a pretty much wildly practical um, version of a satellite. So everything that it's doing has a practical aspect that's a tangible thing on Earth that we could really understand. So has this 3D scanning been done before? So yeah, it, there's plenty of radar uh, missions uh, that are up. And in fact, there's a sister mission called SWAT that launched uh, last year called Surface Water Ocean Topography. Like I said, they were our sister mission, a co collaboration between JPL and the French space agency CNES. And they were doing a similar thing with radar, but looking at the uh, rise and fall of the oceans. Uh, but so what's new is not necessarily doing mapping of Earth or doing a 3D uh, topography mapping. It's the uh, power of and the resolution that we have on NISAR, as well as the fact that it produces a new map uh, so frequently in a polar orbit. It's able to uh, scan sections of Earth and then put them together every two weeks. What's the lifespan? So uh, several years. Uh, with anything that we do, we always hope for longer. So it's, uh, I think it's about a, uh, either a three or a five year lifespan. So it makes many, many maps in that time. What's the resolution? So it's actually uh, several centimeters of resolution. So very good resolution. And then there's, um, with the L band and the S band uh, radars, the L band is basically something with a long wavelength. So that's going to come down and hit um, a solid surface, basically the base solid surface, but the S-band radar with the short wavelength will basically hit the first thing it touches. So you could combine those two, for instance, look at the ground floor of a forest as well as the treetops, and then as you see those measurements over and over again, you can see how those things change. What will cause the demise of the satellite? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Probably not orbit or no more solar power? No, um, solar power is not really the problem. Every, everything has a uh, lifespan on it. Electronic components have a lifespan. So uh, no one really wants to be the first one to go. But as with anything with electronics, with any components, um, there is just a life on them. And how long does it take to build them? So the. Yeah, the actual um, build has been going on for about four or five years now, but this project has been in the planning phases for well over a decade. And so uh, well over a decade ago, this, is, this was originally proposed as just a uh, NASA mission, and we're looking for funding, looking for a partnership. And uh, one of the things that uh, we were, basically NASA was instructed to do was to go seek a partner for this, and ISRO is a major space power. I mean, it's something that not a lot of people know, but the, ISRO is one of the world's leading space agencies, and I think people know that now with Chandrayaan uh, 3 landing on the moon yesterday, uh, but we were instructed to have this basically first major partnership, and JPL and NASA want to do the L-band, Israel want to do the S-band, and we were able to come together in a structure. And what you see here is actually some of the first deliveries of parts. Um, you remember the uh, pandemic days, we've been doing this, uh, we're in, this was in uh, 2020, and we were receiving some of our first components from the Indian Space Agency and some of our first Indian partners who came out to JPL uh, to work with us. So it's been a collaboration uh, for a long time with the Indian Space Agency and 
Uh, here you can see the delivery of the S-band radar uh, and some of the partners coming together to uh, be able to integrate it. And you can see the structure that JPL provided in the background. So that was the um, called, that's the radar structure and that's going to be sort of the, uh, basically the flying server rack for the radar. Um, and here we are receiving it, getting ready to integrate it, going through many, many months of testing before we're all ready to put this together. But this gives an idea of the clean room scenario, as well as looking in at some of the electronics. So this gives you an idea of scale. Um, have to work in and out of this uh, radar. So one of the interesting things about building spacecraft is they're optimized for just about everything but people working on them. So <laughs> you want to do everything to save mass. You want to do everything to pack the most science in. You want to be able to do everything. And so people tend to be an afterthought. So what, I, what my job is is to effectively take the IKEA box of parts and figure out how to assemble it to work in the human factors so that people can actually work on it. And so inside of the structure here, always reminded me of working in like the uh, Jeffrey's tubes in the old Star Trek series, where you're basically um, in as tight of a space as a human can fit to be able to work and do some of the very detailed electronics and cable routing uh, that we have to do inside. And here you can see uh, some of the outside work once this has been a little bit farther along in the process of the build. So some of the restrictions that we have to take into account is that there's not enough space for people to work around. Well, everything is just optimized to work in space. And so things are intended to be lightweight. Things are intended to uh, be an elegant structure. Things are intended to pack the most amount of science, most amount of stuff in. Because you don't want to waste space. Space is money. When you're in space, uh, weight is money. Everything that you do, if you're optimizing it for comfort of people, is not necessarily optimizing it for uh, use in space. And so you have to do a lot of things to make these compromises so you can pack in the most amount of science, most amount of structure, most amount of work, and then still have people able to work it, even if it means that it takes an hour to do one little screw, then that's a sacrifice that sometimes you make uh, to be able to pack it and have the most elegant structure, the tensest um, packing of electronics. And you end up having to uh, build all sorts of wild tooling in order to accommodate that. That's quite a workflow. Yeah. Well, you just said space in space, oh. expensive. Well, so can I ask, is that because of the cost of delivery? Because once you get it up there, doesn't that kind of, is less relevant? Yes, but you're trying to pack the most amount of stuff in the fairing of the launch vehicle. Everything is limited by that fairing, and so you're not going to make a custom bulge because you want to put one uh, extra electronics box. And so a lot of this is to make things compact so they fit in the fairing, um, and then lightweight so you can use the smallest launch vehicle because that's all money to get uh, the launch done. So does everyone know like their position? So yes. when they're working on something, one person goes in, they do their thing, the next person steps in? Yes. Um, the process of building, and you can see some of the this uh, teamwork, to build something this large, it's not just one or two people working on it. We, there's a whole crew of technicians. And so we're all knowing our process. And effectively, I'm the floor lead, so like the foreman of the operation as we're building, and uh, instructing the people to do their specific job to know the overall operation that we need to do. And in this case, uh, we were looking at that boom deployment. Obviously, we've got gravity on Earth, and so we have to have a gravity offload fixture so that we can test this. So we're using counterbalances and weights all strung uh, through an elaborate uh, apparatus so that we can counterbalance it. And effectively, as we're able to test this boom, make sure that it's able to deploy out in zero G so that we know it can work in space. Because we're not going to have all of the robustness for this to work on Earth. If we let go of it, it would break because we have gravity here. That's really interesting. And the people that are with you, are these people that you've worked with before, or is it just a, set, a new set of talent that's coming in, or so science that's coming in to help develop? There's a mixture of old hands and new people, and so, um, as a crew working on the floor, you kind of build a little family, end up spending a lot of time with the same people in silly suits. And so there's a certain esprit de corps that comes from doing something hard. So a uh, mixture of talent from uh, young interns, uh, figuring out the first things, getting kind of baby tasks to people who have been there for 30 years, to people who are experts in this very specific thing. You've got a someone who's just a bearing nerd and is really loving working on bearings for 30 years. And so if you're going to have a bear 
engineering that's going to work perfectly in space, you need some people who live and breathe bearings, and as well as just kind of generalists like myself who know how to kind of take the whole thing together. And in fact, here's an interesting um, specialty. So one of the things that you have to worry about in space is um, all of the thermal aspects, and so keeping the cool parts cool, the warm parts warm, and not make, and making sure that things don't uh, get to be the wrong temperature, and so you end up with thermal blankets. Uh, so this is called multi-layer insulation, and what it is is a blanket that keeps heat in, uh, protects things from uh, radiative heating, make sure that you don't end up um, overheating things or freezing them. And the person who's doing this actually got her start effectively as a tailor. So whether you're a, um, like to sew a blanket, you need the skills of a tailor in order to tailor it to a specific spacecraft. And so you can actually see, um, if you look up Lynn Pham, Tailor to the Stars, she was briefly in a BBC, yeah, Literally I know, great stars. fun. Yeah, in a uh, BBC article that talked about her life story. And she uh, was a Vietnamese immigrant, uh, then was able to work as a tailor, and then got a job in the electronic shop at JPL, eventually let on that she knew how to sew, and suddenly she's able to tailor uh, all of the blankets around these very, very oddly shaped spacecraft. Wow. So are all these individuals, do they live in Los Angeles, or do they kind of come in for a project and go back to? No, we're all uh, pretty okay. much locals. There's a few of the, if you people who have very, very, very odd specialties, electromagnetic uh, interference and radiation, radar, some of those people are living uh, outside because there's only a few people that really know what this is. Some of it is kind of voodoo. But all of the generalists, like you see the uh, folks in the white suits are uh, in Los Angeles. What's the company bar? That'd be nice to hang out. <laughs> um, well, this is really great. In terms of working with India, was that after it was built, or was it during the entire time? So there's some interesting things. Like I mentioned, there's two bands of radar, and this is when we're in the uh, thermal vacuum chamber, but basically half of the structure was built in, or a portion of the structure with one of the bands of radar was built in Ahmedabad in Gujarat in uh, northwest India, and then was shipped to JPL to get integrated, and then once we have an integrated radar, a full thing, we've shipped it back to uh, Bangalore in southern India, and so there's, it's kind of interesting because some of our parts have actually made a full orbit of Earth prior to getting launched, which I think is unique for uh, spacecraft. But I really think it's interesting, and if we could kind of step back and create some yeah. context to the agencies. So there's six main government agencies, or somewhere around there, and there's like 80 other ag government agencies throughout. Um, and India, where it says, that's, it seemed to come out around the same time in the 1969 as the moon landing, I believe. Yeah, and so it, Israel has been a space player since the uh, 60s and 70s, and so they uh, started off working with the Russians, uh, and they had a, um, I mean, you can see some really very interesting archival uh, footage of India uh, in the early days of their space agencies where there, there's people wheeling uh, satellite components around on a bicycle, or there's one where uh, to do electromagnetic testing, uh, you want to have no metal around, no metal interference, no nothing. And so you can have an anechoic chamber as people do now, and then India at the time actually put their satellite on an ox cart and wheeled it out into a field where there was nothing around. And so you can actually see, um, I mean, it is a great photo of uh, a full satellite on an ox cart being wheeled out into a field so they could do some testing. And it's the sort of thing they're kind of, uh, they do more with less. So they're clever. Um, really admire the ability of the Indian like space agency to do a lot more science, a lot more missions with fewer resources and less money. Um, I mean, one of the things that is interesting is the cost of the recent Chandrayaan mission was around $74 million, uh, which is nothing to sneeze at, but it's about half the budget of Interstellar, uh, the movie. Hmm. And so uh, the, they, India uh, had a mission, a uh, Mars mission, a full orbiter around the planet Mars, an interplanetary mission for less than it cost to make the movie The Martian. So. Uh, they're able to do amazing uh, things, and they don't necessarily 
like get the same funding that a lot of other uh, agencies do. Yeah, you hear about you know NASA, obviously JPL, yeah. you hear about SpaceX, um, but you really don't, at least I don't, hear about uh, India so much other than the news recently where they landed um, on the moon, on the south side mm -hmm. of the moon. Uh, could you explain a little about what, how that happened? So, I mean, they've, They've been having moon, they had moon missions uh, about 15 years ago was their first one. So Chandrayaan-1 was their first moon mission. Honestly, when I was a baby engineer at JPL, um, one of the first things I designed, it was a very small collaboration. JPL had a, uh, had a small instrument on that Chandrayaan mission to the moon. So about 15 years ago, they launched a moon mission and had a successful orbiter around the moon. So when I was a baby engineer, one of the very first things I did was build a uh, protective cover and a handling system for this instrument so they could integrate it. And so I, that was one of the things I thought was very cool as I was getting started was, wow, we're working with agencies all across the world. And it's one of those things where if you're like young and idealistic or old and idealistic, whatever you want to say, but the international collaboration for the peaceful exploration of space is one of those things that's really a high achievement for humanity. So thought about that and thought how cool it was to be able to work with other countries around the world and come together to do interesting science. Yeah, I'd love to learn more about that. I do want to go back to the to the satellite, if there's anything more that you wanted to touch upon, if there's any additional photos. Oh, well, I mean, you're seeing some of the build photos and some of the test photos. Um, this is a fun one. I always love photos with satellites with American flags in the background. But um, this is as we're getting into vibration testing. And so some of the photos that you've seen, these are all also publicly available online if you look up nisar.nasa.gov. Um, but you're seeing all of these tests, and you saw some of the very glamorous ones in a weird black uh, can, and that was a thermal vacuum. So as we're building a spacecraft or a satellite, we have to test it to make sure that it survives in space. And here you can see that same photo in that black can. That's a 25-foot vacuum chamber. And so you suck out all of the air and then expose it to all of the weird um, extremes of hot and cold and solar il uh, illumination so that you try and break it on Earth so it doesn't break in space. Uh, so this is one of them. It's kind of the shake and bake cycle uh, where the other one was going onto the vibration table where you build it and you spend, I mean, you're seeing all of the care that we put into building it and spending every time getting every nut and bolt double checked and then you take it and you put it onto a table and the table shakes the hell out of it so that you can uh, basically rough it up and mimic a ride on a rocket ahead of uh, actually giving it the ride on the rocket so you've got confidence that it's uh, going to survive. And so yeah, here's another picture of the vacuum chamber. Um, and then more of the assembly work. Uh, you can see this is a, we're getting closer to the final stages of assembly and you can get a sense for the scale of this. So if you imagine the first pictures and you saw how small this octagonal structure that's the flying server rack is compared to the boom and compared to that 12 meter antenna, that'll give you a sense of how big this is when it's actually fully deployed in space. So everything is compact and then it kind of folds out like a transformer into this giant structure once there's a uh, zero G environment and it can actually survive. Is three tons a good weight? Uh, three tons is, we're a, we're a little bit over three tons for the overall weight of our uh, spacecraft. Uh, so the instrument itself is around uh, one and a half tons and then there's the spacecraft uh, that has the extra weight. So here, um, the other thing that goes into doing this is packing an instrument to get it to India. So we spent all of this time and care just to build it on the ground. So it's a major logistical challenge to move anything, uh, any spacecraft, but to get one all the way around the world to India uh, led to some major logistical challenges that we were able to kind of solve. So here you see the type of care that goes into packing this into a shipping container, a very special environmentally controlled shipping container, uh, so that we could keep it clean and we could keep it well protected because moisture, contamination, dirt, all, all of those things, uh, electronic, electrostatic um, discharge, all of those things could do major damage. So we have to make sure that as we're transporting it around the world, it is very well protected uh, throughout the entirety of the transport. How many times did it have to get changed from one craft to another to get it there? So you'll see some pictures uh, coming up about what it is, but this is this container that we built for it is one of the largest 
objects that was fit into a uh, C-17. So um, C-17 is not the largest uh, airlifter that's in the U.S. Uh, arsenal, uh, but it is a very, very, very large aircraft. And the huge cargo aircraft, this is a 50,000 pound container that we had to figure out how to get up the ramp and into the C-17 so that we could have this uh, well taken care of all the way on its ride. And so uh, for where we started from JPL, we went JPL to the East Coast, to uh, New Jersey, to uh, Air Base in Greece, uh, to Bangalore. And then for one of the other deliveries, we've uh, gone from the uh, JPL to Hawaii, to Guam, to the Philippines, to Bangalore. So uh, it's one of the unique things about uh, Southern India and Los Angeles, they're about as far apart from each other as you can be and still be on dry land. So you get um, nervous or do you chomp at the bit when it goes from location to location? Oh, of course, yes. Um, but a lot of thought and effort goes into packing something like this. And so there's inevitably going to be chaos as you do any sort of transportation, but we do the best as we can to control chaos uh, going in. So. I know that I've done my homework by the time that this is in the air. And so yes, we're nervous, we've got people flying with it to monitor it, uh, and then we've got all sorts of instrumentation to know what shock, temperature, humidity ranges go along with it. But we've done our homework prior to committing this to uh, a ride on a C-17 or a C-130. That's amazing. Oh, if you go out into space. So yeah, um, and in fact, uh, JPL made a little promotional video on this very subject, yeah, so. Uh, this is also a, a viewable on YouTube. Today, we are going to get ready to send NISAR on its voyage from JPL to Indian Space Research Organization in Bangalore, India. That means that we're going to have to suit up and go on to the clean room floor where my team and I have been working for the past three years to get this thing built. Come on, let's go. precision instrument. Later on, we are going to have to assemble this thing, basically pick up a two-ton load and put it together with the precision of a surgeon. So what is NISAR? It is the NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar. This is the radar payload in the engineering panel, so it's effectively the heart and brains of the mission. NISAR will use two powerful radars that can detect very small changes in the Earth's surface. This allows the mission to observe a wide range of Earth processes, from the flow rates of glaciers and ice sheets to the dynamics of earthquakes and volcanoes. Along with our Indian colleagues, we've been building NISAR here in this facility for the last three years. And it took a whole crew, so they're not flying to Bangalore in the container, but this is the entire crew uh, from the mechanical team that's going. It takes an army to get us there. When I first came onto the project, this was just a shell of a payload. We had the aluminum and titanium structure with basically nothing in it. And then they've been populated with electronics and with the radar payload. We brought in a instrument from India, the SSAR. So that's the S-band radar to our LSAR, our L-band radar. Since then, we've been testing it. And today, we're getting ready to put it in the shipping container to send it on to India. Tight fit. So we're going to be working over the next year with our Indian partners to do the final stages of assembly and test. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's been a pleasure being your guide, and I hope to see you when we launch next year. That's great. So when, after this is launched, are you involved with the project afterwards? Do you view the 3D no, data? No, um, I'm a, uh, I do assembly. It's very difficult to do assembly in space uh, without being an astronaut, so move on to the next uh, thing. But um, this is an, it, so very much uh, my role goes up to the point where it's in the fairing uh, and going to the launch site, seeing it off, but I'm a strictly a ground person. Wow. What's the next project? Um, Still to be determined, so 
uh, still working on that. So this is an interesting photo. We had some di uh, dignitaries uh, from Israel as well as uh, the Indian Embassy. Uh, you actually may have seen some of these fellows um, doing the same, uh, doing speaking uh, about Chandrayaan in the news recently. But what we're doing here, uh, we had a send off. And one of the things that we saw early on in the project when their Indian colleagues were sending uh, the SR to us, they had a send-off ceremony where they cracked a coconut in front of the uh, in front of the truck to effectively wish it on its way, um, lay out all of the good things, humble yourself in front of a major task at hand, and do blessings for um, a safe journey in the future. So we, um, our Indian colleagues, helped us um, do the same thing as we moved up to uh, some of our environmental tests, and so that was something that was a. It, part of the collaboration is not just um, all the technical stuff, it's learning from each other. Um, and so the cross-cultural exchange has been great. Honestly, I've enjoyed working and learning so much about our uh, Indian uh, partners, Indian culture. Um, and this was again from our uh, send-off ceremony, uh, two countries coming together. So uh, it's also sort of a diplomacy mission in that we're bringing the two space agencies of the world's two largest democracies together. And so it's been exciting to be a tiny little ambassador for that sort of thing. So it's really cool. whatever you, I mean, it's part of this in addition to doing the good science, it's um, being able to do a small part to bring two uh, countries together and to bring them uh, worlds apart uh, in peaceful exploration of space. What is this, uh, like a one-six scale model? That is exactly a one-six scale model. <laughs> so. And what did you teach them in exchange for that coconut? Was it no, um, so honestly, um, yeah, we've learned a lot. The things that they've done, uh, we actually did take them out to get uh, tacos and tequila um, at some point, uh, but uh, some other colleagues took them to Costco. So <laughs> as far as, uh, yeah, seeing the representation of a uh, United States, Costco's not a bad one. <laughs> so do you communicate uh, with India at all during, like for example, you're based in LA the entire yeah. time, correct? So do you communicate via Zoom or any other? Yeah, kind? telecons at odd hours of the time, yeah. I, my wife uh, recognizes that, uh, yeah, being on telecons late in the day so that we can talk when we're 12 and a half hours apart. Wow. Yeah. That's really interesting. But honestly, there's so much of this job that you just simply have to do in person. You can't build anything from your living room. Sure. So uh, actually have to physically go. And here you can actually see that same shipping container being delivered to the uh, HAL airstrip in Bangalore. So you can see the size of uh, that uh, C-17 and then the container coming out of it, the logistics involved in order to have all of this uh, right work, get the right team uh, so that we can pack. And this is a smaller shipment in a uh, C-130. I know there's some folks here that are into military aviation, but um, the C-17 is like flying in a building and the C-130 is a little bit like a uh, flying RV. So it was a uh, different experience working logistics for both aircraft. Uh, very exciting to be able to set this on and move it on its way. Where did the C-17 take off from? March, uh, March Air Force Base in uh, Riverside. Yeah. Is there a, um, any operations in the world <clears throat> that are building to compete with what JPL does? Or is it pretty unique and it's going to stay that way? I mean, this is a, this particular spacecraft isn't something you really compete with, you kind of uh, work on, but we're collaborations with multiple other agencies. Like I mentioned, our sister project was SWAT, and they were a collaboration with uh, France, uh, ESA. Uh, for the most part, JPL and NASA try and collaborate across uh, inter with other international uh, space agencies fairly frequently. One of the previous projects that I was on and Aaron in the audience was also on was uh, InSight, and that was a Mars lander that was also working with um, European countries, France, Germany, Poland, um, England. So a lot of this work is collaborative with other uh, countries. And each agency has its own specialty kind of that it does, right? Yeah, I mean, we're all good at our own things. Um, JPL tends to think it's good at everything, um, but uh, but there's actually a lot to learn. I mean, part of this is learning uh, from each other, and so, yeah, you, it's subtle nuance things, but 
we learn what the different uh, agencies are good at, they learn what we're good at and uh, what we can specialize in. That's um, really interesting. One of the things that comes to mind is I took a project management class and it seemed a lot of the study of project management mm -hmm. stemmed from 1969 NASA going to the moon. Mm -hmm. So that kind of set up the groundwork for other companies to kind of figure out how do you manage your workflow internally. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, it seems like now you're scaling beyond the company and you're working with other individuals outside of it. Um, is there anything that you've learned from that process that can kind of help with the day-to-day -day of everyone's kind of workflow that they have for themselves? Oh, I mean, there's a huge amount that we've learned about working with um, the various partners. I mean, any partnership has its challenges, and certainly this one has. Um, so there's a lot of nuances with working across international borders, how you can ask for things, how you expect um, to get response, how you can ask for things and get the right responses, how you can know who the right people are, what the different um, hierarchical structures are. Israel has seemed a lot more hierarchical to us, uh, and I think that's something that's pretty common uh, in working with India, is that your boss says something and you do it. There's not room to talk back. The idea of talking to your, back to your boss is just not something that's done, whereas we're a lot more loose with that, and uh, there's more room for people at the lower levels to speak up and say, no, I think you're wrong, and it's, uh, it's less rigid. So trying to deal with the different structures of uh, kind of power, authority, how you talk to people, how you work with people has been something that's a challenge for us and it's something just kind of interesting to work with. It's not that anything, any approach is better or worse than the other, but you're going to see that across different countries and then be able to find some way to meet in the middle in your collaborative um, approaches. And that seems where the diplomacy it's, comes in. Yeah. You know, it's going to be uncomfortable for everyone and that's part of it. Right, because you have your own way of working and you're, and you, as you're saying, something like hierarchy, for example. Yeah. Um, and it's something, you know, you're telling stories about how you have these interns that are contributing fairly significantly to the project. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that's, that perhaps you're beholden to within your corporation. Um, and that may not, I'm oh, sorry, the government agency. Yeah. Um, and that may not necessarily be the same for another country. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to kind of, just because you like it and you think it's the greatest thing, you don't want to impose that on someone else in their system. Right, I mean, you have to, ha with any big project and any collaboration, any relationship really, you have to approach it with a sense of humility and understand that you have something to learn from everyone. And so the idea that you're going to go and impose your way of doing things and everyone else is, well, that's not really a partnership. And so, I mean, here you can actually see the partnership coming together. So this was only a few months ago when the radar structure was integrated to the spacecraft in Bangalore. So this is actually taken in a clean room in Bangalore, and this is a merging of the two teams. You can see uh, the Indian partners and the uh, American partners working together, and this was kind of a golden spike moment for the project as this big radar payload and the spacecraft came together and were together as one unit for the first time. So uh, this is a testament to teamwork and everything it takes to get us there. Why was the decision made to launch from India instead of here? Uh, that all goes into government contracts and some of the sausage making of who pays for what. Uh, but fundamentally, the final system is being integrated in India. And so if you're in Bangalore, uh, it's going to be a lot quicker to go over to Shrihari Kota near Chennai than it is to fly all the way back around the world and go out of Kennedy Space Center or uh, Vandenberg. So it's, and India is a, a very, very, very capable launch vehicle provider. They're also, um, there's the color of money aspect where uh, they, provide very affordable launch vehicles. They are incredibly um, powerful with the amount of capability they have and their success rate. Are they closer to the equator, their site? They are, but we're actually gonna be in a polar orbit, so it doesn't necessarily help us as much. So, uh, because we're gonna want to make a map of the Earth, we're kind of going around, and as the Earth is spinning, we're uh, seeing the different parts of it. So we're actually kind of going in a circle north and south as opposed to, you really get benefits from the um, equatorial launch if you're going to be in like a geosynchronous orbit. How long does it take to get to where you hit the same spot again? 12 days. Yeah, 12 days. It's about a 12 day cycle to make the map. 
Well, the amount of data must be ginormous. It is huge, and so the, uh, I forgot what it is. I mean, we're gonna be generating like petabytes of data, so it's, it is, um, in, yeah, no, it's, it doesn't fit on a USB. Um, so the, the challenges of processing the data are going to be their own thing, but that's for people down the road. So they can build it, they can figure that out later. It's not. When it starts to uh, unfurl, mm -hmm. deploy one segment each day, and I'm referencing a Hubble where they talked about 400 plus points in sequence that if it didn't yep. work, it was worthless. Uh -huh. How many of those points do you have? It's just much less complicated. No, uh, I mean, there's one of the interesting things with anything in space is that what you tend to do, rather than having something very complicated, is having a whole series of very simple things. And so we're fundamentally four hinges and then pulling a string to deploy everything out. And so you try and stack together a whole series of very, very, very simple mechanisms so that together they can do something very powerful as opposed to having a lot of things happen at the same time. I mean, the types of mechanisms that we have are you open up a, you like release a burn wire, release a bolt, and then you just have a passive spring to move something and open it up. You have something driven by a single motor to run a latch. You have something uh, that's effectively pulling a string to do an origami structure um, and use basic, simple machines because they're reliable and you can stack them together and make a very, very complicated thing. So yeah, you end up with these things where they do, they are like Rube Goldberg machines where uh, one, two, three, four all have to go in a certain order or it doesn't work, but you try and make those as simple and perfect as possible and as reliable as possible. So there's a huge amount of thought that goes into making things reliable and redundant so that you expose yourself to the minimum risk possible as you're going through big complicated operations. It's kind of the magic of it. It's all simple machines. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we do is just basic, simple machines. Um, in doing the tooling, I have a book called Engineering in the Ancient World, and uh, a lot of the stuff that we do just to be able to build something, the Romans could have done, because you just need to move a big block onto another big block. Um, but then we have to do it very, very, very well. So. It's a, so yeah, you do have a lot of single point failures. You try and back those up, make them redundant, but then you stack simple, reliable mechanisms on top of each other. What's the name of that book? Uh, Engineering in the Ancient World. That was interesting. Yeah, it's a fun one to see. I mean, what you can do with human and animal labor uh, <laughs> with simple machines. There's some pyramids. Yeah. <laughs> JPL has had a couple of uh, synthetic aperture radars in the past. Excuse me, guys. We, we do have a Q&A at the end, but I'll ask if you're going to ask a question. We need you on the microphone so we can oh. hear what's oh. going on. We record these, and when people talk out of turn, we can't hear what's going on in the room. So oh. <laughs> do you want to do the Q&A now, or do you want to do it oh. at the end? Well, yeah. before we get to the Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as we continue through and get to the end of the Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, well, is there anything that you want to be able to touch upon that you have felt that you haven't really touched upon yet? Oh, well, let's see. Let's If we keep going through the rest of the pictures, I think there's a few others. I mean, okay, so I got to the end of the, um, the end of the parts with the spacecraft and just working in Bangalore um, has been very interesting. Um, because Bangalore is so rapidly changing. I'll go there every couple of months uh, for a few weeks at a time, and every time I go there, it is something new. The skyline changes. They're constantly building. So uh, as well as the space program um, very much in the news, Bangalore is India's tech hub, and talking with some of the old timers there from the Indian Space Agency, well, where we're staying, they're like, oh, I remember when that was a village, and that was only 20 years ago, and now there's skyscrapers and things. And so there's very much a mix of old and new, and so you can see, like, then there's also things that have been there for thousands of years. And so uh, some of these pictures just show some of the fun things that you see, uh, the temple complexes. Um, it seems that, like, religion and spirituality is still very much a part of 
uh, everyday life. And even at ISRO, uh, we see there's shrines and things uh, to various gods going into the machine shop, asking about some markings on the wall. And they say, oh, this is uh, blessing and showing respect to the tools. Um, and then you end up seeing a mixture of high rises and then at the ground level there's people uh, who are out in the streets who are um, very much living traditional lives. And so it's wildly interesting to be out and about in Bangalore. Um, this is interesting because we talk about all the work platforms and so this is not in ISRO. ISRO is, uh, things are very high quality and safe. Uh, but you see in the outside world the way that people work on scaffolding. It's just been wild to see because a lot of what I do is scaffolding, OSHA, figuring out work platforms and then to yeah, see like people basically branches. climbing four stories up right. on nothing but um, kind of bamboo strung together has been uh, very eye-opening and so it's part of learning and part of like I said coming together and having the adventures just going out and seeing the outside world beyond the clean room um, there's so much to see and learn from in going to India right well, I'm very curious you know at least, and, and I could be, oh, do you want to talk about this? No, this is just the uh, KR market, largest flower market in India. So just the amazing things that you see outside, once you get outside of that uh, very sterile, white clean room. I thought this was an interesting picture because everything in the clean room looks so sterile, white, and then uh, India is just a burst of color anywhere that you, once you leave the clean room. That's really gorgeous. Um, but what I'm really curious about is in working and collaborating with different countries, do you feel over the course of you know, the development of these government agencies that walls have come down a bit and there's more transparency in areas? In the long term, I mean, every project, it's hard because you're looking at your small task at the time. And so, um, part, but yeah, part of this is just making inroads in and building friendly relations with other countries who we should have friendly relations with. Um, so the small things on a day-to-day -day business, it's hard to say whether we've done anything or that whether I've done anything, but you build relationships with people and that's how it starts. And, and you so, maintain those relationships? Yeah, I want to maintain the relationships, build friendships, and hopefully that does something. It's hard to say, but that's all part of uh, playing the great game of diplomacy, I guess, right. for the, um, yeah. So is social <laughs> media a tool in which you still communicate with those people that you develop friendships with? Yeah, it's um, trying to maintain those friendships. It's really good to work with people, be able to work with brilliant, humble, um, dedicated people from around the world. And that's been one of the true pleasures of the project, is getting to meet some of these other people, building those relationships, and trying to maintain them. And so, cool. uh, while I don't know how much that plays in the grand diplomacy game, um, on a personal level, it's been uh, a very good and eye-opening thing. Awesome, well thank you very much. I uh, would love to open up the floor to questions. Oh. <laughs> My question is on national security, because it seems to me if you're going to have a global picture every 12 days, there'd be real benefits to tracking what China's doing with Taiwan, what Russia's doing in the Ukraine, not to mention a lot of drug lords who are growing things out in the open in different parts of the world. Who has access to this data, and, and like, why doesn't somebody shoot this thing out of the there because it could be a strategic disadvantage for them. So, I mean, the purpose of NISAR is earth science. What people do with the data from there, I mean, they're very, I can say that very smart people take a look at all sorts of data. There is this, there is undoubtedly similar technology in play. This, those sorts of national security questions you can't really answer in an open forum. Yeah. Will there be any filter on the data to keep people from looking at certain areas or things? This should, for the most part, be open source data. So, I mean, it's, like I said, it's tuned to earth science. So, if there's going to be something tuned to, say, vehicles moving that's going to be uh, in the uh, details of, in those very, very, very strong details of, uh, synthetic aperture, which I can't really speak to. So uh, I know the devil is in the details and the nuances with any of this. 
and this is open source. JPL three has data. had a couple of uh, synthetic aperture radars uh, missions in the past, albeit a, uh, quite a while back. The last one, if memory serves, was Sir C, uh, and it had, if, I, if memory serves correctly, an X band. It was two frequency two, and either L band or S band. X band is a much higher frequency than S band. Mm -hmm. Should have had better resolution than S band. How does this mission compare with Sir C, and what is the advantage of this mission over Sir C? To be honest, I wish I could answer that question for you. The details of radar are not my forte, so um, I'm a nuts and bolts guy. Radar is a little bit of voodoo, so um, beyond uh, knowing the kind of basics, I wish I could answer that better. So who's going to own the data? You said it's open source. Yes. And what resolution will be made available publicly? To be honest, I don't know. I mean, as far as who owns the data, it's all of you because you're paying for it. Um, so this is largely going to be uh, something that's published uh, in an open way. I don't know the exact details, but if you do look on the nisar.jpl.nasa.gov, there's a whole, um, I mean, you can download kits and things for users of the data. And so if you're interested in that, I'd recommend that you go to the website and there's effectively a user's guide. There's open source, there's calls for applications of the data. People are starting to write papers and proposals for what they could do with this data. And so I don't know if it's something you can just, I don't think it's something you don't download from a website, but I think it's something that you can apply to have and then be able to get the data if you've got a university project or a science mission or something that you want to do with that and write that proposal and get that data. So from a mechanical standpoint, sometimes uh, mechanical things need to be exercised. So this thing has been de delivered to India. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's in a package. I mean, do they open this thing up and exercise the stuff so that right before it, it takes off, the mechanical stuff, they know that it's just not going to seize up or, or not be... Uh... So we've run it through reliability testing and then put it through all of the uh, environmental tests. So what? I mean, it's a good question, and it's one of the reasons why we go through those environmental tests. So. It takes a certain amount of time when things are stowed, and then as you run through um, the extreme temperatures and vacuum environment and vibration levels and acoustic levels, uh, you're exposing it to basically the worst of it so that when we make sure that things deploy again after those tests, we do them before and after to make sure that, yeah, it works, and then we do the worst that we can to it and it still works. Time is always a concern, like you're mentioning, any sort of mechanism needs to be uh, serviced, but we do a lot, I mean, one of the reasons why we're in all of those silly little um, hefty bag uh, Oompa Loompa outfits is because we're working in a clean room environment so that we don't have the corrosive elements. We don't, we have a tight control of humidity so that we can make sure that our lubricants uh, stay uh, lubricants as opposed to uh, becoming glues, or that our glues don't uh, lose their strength. So a lot of environment, a lot of analysis goes into the environments to make sure that this stuff actually has a lifespan to it. Yeah, uh, I know that uh, by law, U.S. agencies cannot uh, use Indian uh, launch facilities. They're forbidden, I think. Uh, like a few years back, one of the startups here, they used Indian launch facility for launching. Like, they were doing constellation of uh, mm -hmm. satellites, and uh, they couldn't lose time. They couldn't get any facility here. So they used the Indian ISRO uh, rocket, and uh, that caused problem with the administration here. Oh, I wasn't, uh, I, w I mean, this is high level sort of government negotiations yeah. to be able to launch. So it did launch. take a tick for tat uh, legislation at both the countries. Indians are not allowed to use U.S. Uh, rockets and U.S. cannot use Indian rockets. <laughs> so I thought, did you get a waiver or how is this? <laughs> I, like I said, this is a, this is a, something between our state departments to be able to negotiate this partnership and to show that we can launch out of uh, Shrihari Kota in the east coast of India. So I'll, it, from the very beginning, this has been known that we were going to be on an Indian launch vehicle. And I think some of the uh, things with private industry not wanting to launch or not being allowed to launch out of India has a lot more to do with uh, protectionism and making sure that money doesn't flow out of the U.S. and into India or vice versa when we have our own indigenous um, or local launch providers that the government wants to give the money to. 
Hey, Scott. Um, so to land a uh, lander on the surface of the moon for half the cost of interstellar means you have a certain amount of scrappiness in your space program. Uh, what do you think the U.S. space program could learn from the way that the Indian space program works, and how can uh, the U.S. space program become more agile? So that was kind of an interesting conversation that we had the other day. We were talking about technology readiness levels and all of the uh, hoops that we have to jump through before we can use something on a big space mission. And we were talking with some of our Indian colleagues about that, and they're like, oh, well, someone will just come up with an idea, and then we will generate that idea, build it, and launch it, and it's going to be within uh, a year or two. So. They're able to, they have some of the, like you said, scrappiness of like a startup along with the knowledge and infrastructure of a large government agency. So uh, some of that is just, they, I mean, they have different red tape, but they seem to have a lot less red tape in terms of the amount of uh, paperwork and bureaucracy that goes into certain aspects. I mean, we all have our pluses and minuses, but they can, in a very agile way, come up with an idea and get it on a launch vehicle in a relatively small amount of time. And they're very, very, very good at having uh, common use platforms. So they are really streamlined in a lot of their processes and they have a spacecraft bus that works for them. And whatever science mission you want to glom onto that, they've got a ready-made spacecraft bus that you can use to uh, put whatever science missions on it you want. So there's a lot more ability just to take something new, put it on something that works and get it up and then see how it does. Uh, I've been really very, very impressed with all of their, um, the common use and the thought that goes into planning ahead and knowing that you can have things made on a sense of scale. This is kind of a nerdy question. Um, this is kind of a nerdy talk. Okay. <laughs> yes. So the photograph of this Indian assembly room, where it's about 30 people, mm -hmm. um, I noticed that a lot of the crew had beards. Mm -hmm. And I had an experience as a production designer and film going into a food packing plant, fish packing, that they wouldn't let me in with a beard. It was Gordon's fish sticks. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I actually had to go shave that beard to go in and do my research, uh, to just see the inside of the plant. Um, and so I was interested, because I didn't see any face coverings. I wondered if there's um, any kind of yeah, hygienic concerns, or because I don't know what you guys have to deal with in terms of contaminants. Uh, I, I noticed the yeah. shower you said. So it's been a different process, and some of the, um, a lot of the work they do is not necessarily in as contamination sensitive environments. And so radar is not particularly contamination sensitive. When things, when you're working around optics or anything that actually is, then people put on their masks, put on their gloves, and make sure that uh, they're well protected. But that is process differences, and we do tend to, like at JPL, um, tend to spend a lot of time working on uh, making sure that everything is very, 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 very clean. They, um, I'd say that a lot of their work tends to be less in tune with super clean uh, work other than optics. And actually when we, they've got another mission that's going to be launching soon, so uh, called Adithya, that's going to be a mission to study the sun. And because that was an optical mission, we saw people in the full bunny suits at uh, the ISRO facility. So. Um, they're a lot more thrifty when it comes to disposables, and so if they don't need it, they're not going to use it. We take they, one more. Yep. I want to ask about working with that other foreign culture, the defense industry, because mm -hmm. Northrop Grumman built the radar, I guess. Uh, having worked with the agile, creative Indians, was corporate defense America. Um, how was working with those guys? So, I mean, there's pluses and minuses to every partnership, and so uh, there's something to learn from everyone, and there's processes that I admire and processes that I'm frustrated with with any company. Um, so I mean, I kind of will leave it at that uh, because ultimately we are partners, and we want to be good partners uh, when 
speaking about anything. So I, there are things that frustrate me with working with defense giants and larger companies, and there are things that I really admire. So I think the thing to do with any partnership is to look for the good in it and see what you can learn and improve on yourself uh, rather than dwell on any sort of negative. Awesome, well thank you very much, Scott. This is a really informative and entertaining talk. Thank you. And for the folks at home, if you can't find your local JPL bar, you can always come to the Adventures Club yeah. on Thursday nights. Yeah, Scott will be back. Thank you very much. Thank you.